Okay, can I, um, can I, actually, can I switch gears completely? So maybe, I'm going to record this for the people who are out and also my first period who is, was like completely gone because of this field trip. So um, I want to record some of our discussion here right now and then also throughout the rest of this class. So we'll come back to that problem that was disappeared in the warm-up, or maybe we won't. It's fine either way. But certainly between now and the end of class, hopefully you'll become uh, familiarized again with the things that you knew about like the rules of exponents and all that, along with us going deeper, too. That's my promise to you. Okay. Now, before I go any further, can I say something quickly about SLT9? I, I don't know if we came all the way to the end of that. Um, you guys did that uh, stopping distance, right, thing we were doing on Friday. And we were talking about this idea of average rates of change. And in particular, it's an interesting question on nonlinear functions. I understand you guys like talking about slope, right? Some of that, that word came up a little bit. I understand what that means and how it helps us understand rates of change for a linear function. Or slope of a line, I understand that. But what do we mean when we're talking about rates of change or average rate of change on a nonlinear function? And I drew, drew something like this. I just wanted to show you like some arbitrary function. I drew something like this on the board on Friday. And um, I don't know if we ever came to any resolution on it. I said, here's some function. Um, and on it, I have two points, say, uh, x1 and x2. And their y-coordinates, how about our y1 and y2? Or you could call these f of x2 and f of x1. OK, great. And then the question was, sorry, that doesn't line up perfectly, but you get the meaning. I thought I already explained that. That's for the, all the kids. I, like, all my whole first period was gone today, and I'm going to have them watch it. So, um, Because of this field trip. There are a bunch of us gone here today. Uh, all right, so what, the question is, what's the question again? What's what is the, the average rate of change on the interval x1, x2, which you could write that way? Right, is that OK notation? You understand what that means? On the interval x1, x2, what's the average rate of change? Another way of writing it would be like this, right? Right, all the x values. We're talking about the x values between x1 and x2. What's the what's the average rate of change on the interval? And of course, I can't. You can't give me an actual answer for this function. Give me what I want here is a general method for computing the average rate of change. And I think we did maybe write it, but just like as people were leaving on Friday. So um, B wants to say. Yeah, and that. That, like, quote unquote, formula, I do think I've seen before um, in the context of lines. It's the slope formula. Does it, is it meaningful in this context, too? Uh, yeah, and by the way, is this what you were doing in your homework and in general in class with that, even that, those three curves I gave you a picture of the curves and asked you about the rates of change? In general, if you want to talk about the rate of change on, a, on an interval of some function, any function, you can think about the change in y versus the change in x for that function. Now, keep in mind, if you do that, that you're kind of pretending that that function is no longer, this blue function is no longer curvy, you're kind of pretending that it's a line, aren't you, between those two points? Which is maybe, you're like, well, how is that useful? Um, by the way, you could also write this this way, couldn't you? Is that a fair way to write it, too? Um, how is that useful to pretend? It seems like, isn't that a lie? Haven't we like kind of ignored completely the actual behavior of the function? But let me, I, 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 I claim that that's not the case at all, and actually that this is a very useful and interesting question to ask. What's the average rate of change of a function? For example, remember when we came in, we, we did this thing with the uh, road trip or whatever, and I asked you about the velocity of, of the car, or the speed of the car at different times. If I told you that I went in one hour, I went 40 miles, you'd be like, well, your average speed is 40 miles per hour, right? Now, does that actually say anything really useful about what my speed was along the way? No. Not necessarily. I mean, my, my speed could have very rarely been 40 miles per hour, right? Like, maybe I went 60 for a whole bunch of the time, and then I went 25 for some of the time. So it actually doesn't maybe communicate that, informa that much information. And yet it still does, doesn't it? I mean, we still think that's useful information after having done my trip for one hour to say, oh, I averaged 40 miles per hour, right? So it is still a useful and interesting question for us to ask. 
about the average rate of change of a function. So I'd like you to be able to apply this, and I think you can, right? Right? Can't you do this now to any function you like? Absolutely, on any interval you like. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, one other thing I want to like just touch on and kind of hint at a direction for in the future, and maybe hint at, hint at what you're going to do in calculus in, in a year and so far so over now. Um, on the back of this, there are a series of questions that ask you successively, success, successively narrower intervals. It says, what's the average rate of change on 0 to 300? 50 to 250, 100 to 200, 125 to 175. You're listening on 4, 5, 6, and 7 on the back of a stopping distance worksheet. And I'm sure you calculated those correctly. Uh, the answers are uh, one third. Um, what are the units? P, wait, no. Miles per hour per feet. One third miles per hour per feet. Uh, number five, it's, um, is it 0.25? I'm just caught, I'm just looking here. Yeah. Okay, all right, 0.25 miles per hour per foot. Number six is 0.239 miles per hour per foot. And number seven is 0.32 miles per hour per foot. <coughs> if those are wrong, then um, Dr. Sophia, because okay, I just stole her paper. <laughs> um, miles per hour per foot. All right, then this is, the, this is a very interesting question to be. Question number eight. What is, which of these do you think best approximates the rate of change at d equals 150? Now notice, all, the only thing we've talked about so far is rates of change on an interval. That makes good sense to us. But are we even allowed to ask what's the rate of change of a function at a particular point? Does that make sense? For a line, it makes sense, certainly. Does it make sense for a curve? Maybe it does. It's certainly true that if you were driving along, I could I can look down at my speedometer and tell you at a particular instant what how fast you're going, right? So definitely there is an answer, and definitely it's a question I should be allowed to ask, right? But how do we get that from a function? How do we get the rate of, I know how to calculate the rate of change now on an interval. Which of the ones above, let's, ask, let's actually ask the question, which do you think best approximates the rate of change at t equals 150 on that sheet? of your four calculations above. Is it four, five, six, or seven? And maybe you can even give a reason. Johnny, think you know? Um, seven, because we, the point is around, the other points are less broad and they're closer to the target number mm -hmm. 150. Yeah, I like your intuition. We don't have like a lot of language to describe this yet, but I like your intuition. This should be a good intuition. And she's saying that like, if you want to approximate the actual slope of the curve, at x equals x1, then maybe choose not x1 and x2, but choose x2, this other point, to be really, really close to x1, right? Pick points really close to it. And that actually makes me think of like when people actually calculate your speed if you, with a radar gun. If, you, if you're a cop and you have a radar gun, do you know how they work? Or the speed cameras do the same thing, too. Do you know how they do it? How do they do it? They don't move it. No, they keep it one close. Yeah. They measure the time from when it enters the camera view to when it exits the camera view. Okay, yeah, so if, if, if you're doing video, you mean? Yeah, but if you have a radar gun, or actually some of them, I think they do take video now, and so actually they have multiple measurements for those speed cameras. But a radar gun, like if I want to, um, if I, do you know how radar works in general? Yeah. Okay, so you send out a radio wave, and it hits the trash can, and then it comes back if I want to measure how far my trash can away is. And it'll tell me how far away my, my because we know the speed of sound um, propagating through the air, and it'll come back, and, and we'll know how far away the trash can is, because we know, right? Does it make sense? We can figure out how far the trash can is. But that tells me how far the trash can is away, but at this one moment. But how do I calculate how fast it's going? Yeah? It like sends out one, and then it sends out another one. Yes, it sends out two is the key. You ping it twice. And the difference, like maybe they're one second apart, they're actually probably like a millisecond apart or something, right? Um, we should actually look this up. And, and it'll calculate two distances. Now for the trash can, if I do boom, boom, it'll pick up two distances and they'll be the same, right? That won't be very interesting. But if I do it with your car, then those two, do you think you could calculate the velocity of your car? 
if I give you at two different times very close together, two di different distances? I think, I think you could, couldn't you? Using methods we just talked about. And the key there is that they're very, very close together, right? And that actually gives you an incredibly accurate, basically perfect uh, estimate for your instantaneous rate of change on that call. It's, it's not an average rate of change anymore, really, but it kind of is. But it's our, our approximation for the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, I just wanted to whet your appetite a little bit. That more, more on that when you get to calculus. Okay, we're definitely it's like the business of calculus is to think about rates of change. Um, it's like for the full, whole first half of the calculus course, you'll talk about rates of change. So, a little flavor of it now because we can. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say about SLT nine? Good on that. Feeling good. Certainly for the quiz tomorrow, you need to be able to. Uh, it's on SLT 6 through 9, and the quiz will, uh, 6 through, 6 and 7, remember, we're asked graphing ra uh, square root and cube root and quadratic and cubic functions and their transformations by hand without a calculator. Okay, so you should you need to be able to do that. And then SLT 9 was um, this stuff, rates of change. Can you calculate, for any arbitrary function, can you calculate the average rate of change on an interval that I choose, right? Make sense? Okay, so hopefully you feel good about the quiz tomorrow. All right, let's return to our discussion about, and we're sorry, sorry flipping the page here again. Um, let's return to our discussion on exponents and like, and I promise all of this will come back on relate. I promise. We're doing SLT 10 today, and um, you have as soon as you get this, you have some problems that are hopefully just a little bit easier than the warm up problem. We'll come back and maybe it'll hold on later when we feel more confident. But see if you can help each other at your table remember the rules that you might have once known in algebra or whenever. You might want to work on the problems on the left simultaneously as you think about the rules you might remember on the right. So you're supposed to fill in both. And before anyone asks, because I hear some people already explaining out there, before anyone asks, so wait, I don't get number eight, or no, I don't get number two, or whatever, okay, let's, let's look, look at the rules real quick, and then if, then if you have a question, then if you have a question, you're allowed to ask it, okay? Well, let's make sure we understand firmly in mind what, what we're supposed to do when we sort of see certain situations. And again, this should be a reminder, even though I know it's been a while. So if you haven't already done so, please, like, 
think about the right column. Have you already generalized these rules? This is the business, by the way, of what a mathematician does, right? Like we want to generalize conjectures we might have. We want to like formalize with precise language. And, and that's what our goal is today, too, is uh, what this week, I have my mathematical practice up there, it says attend to precision. And part of what we mean by precision is preci precise language. We're very big on that in mathematics, right? So can you precisely make these conjectures in the right column? And we'll give you another minute here to count those rules if you haven't already. Again, what's your group? Zero equals zero. Zero equals zero. to the m times x to the n. I want to make sure we understand the rule. OK, fine. Yeah, you can maybe just say it. But I also want to make sure you remember where these come from, because you should be able to derive, re-derive, all of these rules by yourself on your own, right? In math, we're never about memorizing things, right? We're always about proving, explaining, and sense-making. So why does the first one make sense? For example, I think we can go back to the definition of what we mean to take something to the m and to the n power. Like, what does it actually mean to do x to the m times x to the n? Doesn't it actually mean we have x times x times x m times? Isn't that what x to the m means? Like m yeah. copies of x multiplied together? Yeah. Yeah. And isn't x to the n similarly, right? So what are we looking at? How many x's? This is now just a counting game, isn't it? How many x's are there? And clearly, aren't there m plus n of them? So I think we're done. Clearly, x to the m plus n. What's the next one? What's the rule there when we do x to the m divided by x to the n? What do we do there? What do we get? x to the Say like you mean it's over. Yeah, x to the m minus n. And again, the reasoning there is very similar as well, right? If you have m copies of x and n copies of x, on balance, how many do you have when you divide out all the ones that overlap? Well, clearly, you have the difference between the two. For, let's take an example, right? If you, have, um, if you have 5 to the third over 5, isn't that 5 times 5 times 5 divided by 5? And clearly, you get the difference between them, right? So again, don't, are we making this clear? Don't memorize the rules. It's good if you know them. But at any moment, I should be able to stop you and be like, why does that work? From the definition, explain, why does that work, right? But you should be able to explain why it just makes sense. x to the m to the n. A lot of people, I think, have trouble. Do I add powers or do I multiply them? Go back to the definition of what it means to take the power. What do we mean by x to the m to the n? What do we mean by that? Well, we mean n copies of x to the m, don't we? x to the m, x to the m, x to the m, x to the m, n times, don't we? Isn't that what it means to take something to the nth power? And what does x to the m mean? Well, each x to the m means m x's, yeah? So how many are there total? If there are m x's here, m x's here, n times, isn't it pretty clear that, if, again, it's just the counting game, how many x's are there? Well, there are m times n of them, aren't there? It should, should just make intuitive sense, too. Again, at any moment, you should be able to go back to the definitions. 
I hope that helps you understand. Like, if you're, if you're in this situation, you're like, okay, I have x to the 2 to the 3rd. Is that x to the 5th or x to the 6th? I forget. Well, stop thinking and memorizing. But actually, like, work this out. What does that actually mean? It means x squared times x squared times x squared, doesn't it? Isn't that what that literally means, to cube something? And if you need to, right now you might be like, okay, yeah, I'm pretty convinced it's x to the 6th. But if you really needed to, you could go all the way to this. Anyway, one way or another, you don't, the point is the rules are, are, are not to be memorized, okay? What about x times y to the m? Again, what does that mean? Well, it means x times y times x times y, m times. So in the end, and you know you can rearrange this product underneath here, how many m's do you have? And how many, m, how many, excuse me, how many x's do you have? And how many y's do you have? m of each, I hear you say. Well, then let's write it this way. It's kind of a distributive law for exponentiation, isn't it? And a similar thing holds for division, too, right? You can kind of distribute an exponent over division. So far, so good on those rules? Now, there's one, there are two on there that I didn't mention. Which are those? By the way, you don't need all the work in between if you don't want. On the paper, you just write the end result down here, but I'll we'll make sure you understand. Which one did I skip? Yeah, the negative and what about the what about these two? All right, help me fill in this table. Are you ready? Two to the second. Good. Why is this lagging on me? I don't know why. Two to the third. Eight. Let's see if I can. Hmm. Is there a reason that this is not working? I don't know. Maybe you should use the old-fashioned board. Yeah. No, can't. Yeah, I'm a recording for tape, that's why. Oh, you're recording the board? Yeah. That's your recording Here, let me. Are you recording the sound? Yeah. Yeah, including what you just said. All right, let's try again here. Hello. Maybe it'll work this time. Nope, still not working. Okay. Let's just do it. Let's just do it verbally. Okay. Okay. What is this? Eight. What's the next one? And if you didn't know what two to the fifth was, by the way, off the top of your head, which maybe you do if you played around with powers before, it's 32, right? How would you how would you get it if you were making in the progress of making the table? What are you doing to get the next one? Yeah, aren't you just going to multiply by two each time? Yeah. All right. Now I have a question for you. What about two to the first? Why? Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that if this rule holds, it should be true that we do wh whatever. Yeah, how do we go back up the table? Oh, okay, we can divide by two to go back up the table. So this has to be two. If I could write it, I would. But I can't. Because my board is messed up. I don't know why. Okay. That's a two. What about two to the zero? Yeah, if you are dividing by two again, here I will write it over on the board. Sorry for those who are here. Two to one. Two to the zero. Uh, two to the second is four. And if we're dividing by two, this is two. This has got to be one. Two to the zero. In fact, by the way, of course, it's not just two to the zero. If anything, if we're making this table with like five to some power, it would also be one, wouldn't it? All right, and then what about two to the negative first? What's that got to be? One over two. We need something that when we multiply it by 2 gives us 1, right? So I think 1 half will do it, won't it? What about 2 to the negative second? We need something that when we multiply it by 2 times 2 as we come down gives us 1 half. So I think, does this in general make sense? What's the rule for x to the negative m? 1 over 2 to the thing. Yeah, 1 over 2 to the thing. Or on your paper you'll write what? One over, over x to the positive. One over x to the m, right? And again, these are not rules to be memorized. It should make sense why if we want this nice pattern to hold, then you just you just have to define x to the zero and x to the negative m in that way, don't you? If you want to be consistent, then we do. Okay. Alright, continue. Sorry, my interlude is over. Number eleven and twelve and thirteen. It might look like we're kind of 
changing the what we're doing, but we're not. By the way, assume X is positive here. Yeah. Why does that work? people have answered number 11, had a chance to think about it. I, I saw some people write, um, they cancel each other out, or what else did I see out there? That, um, they know each other. They know, what did you say? No. Null, nullify each other or something? Yeah, they, um, what, what did you guys say here? Cancel out? What other word might we use for the relationship between the action of one of these and the action of the other? Yeah, inverses. Hopefully there's that's still a thing in our vocabulary, right? Inverses, yeah. Because they're inverses, that's why that works. Okay? Have you looked at number 12 and 13 yet? I want you to think about what goes in that box. You know how to check your answer, right? Even if you don't know how to get your answer, you know how to check it. And then once you've figured out 12 and 13, I want you to understand how 11 and 12 connect. What's the conclusion you can make after looking at 11 and 12 together? I mean, I need you to write the power of the box. I want you to make that observation. The one the power you put in here is equivalent. Oh, okay. That's the observation I want you to make. Okay, so, so have you made an observation as you look at 11 and 12? So do you get what you said you did? in the box. We need, again, uh, those who have, have answers, I was, it's easy for me to come around and check. Even though we don't know how to, maybe if you're not sure how to come up with the box answer, you do know how to check it. It should be true that whatever someone puts and brings you and claims is the answer, brings to you, it should be true that when you do, what, what's the rule when you have power of power? It's, it's, yeah, so it should be true that whatever someone claims is the answer, you should be able to do this. Two times their answer equals one. And what's the unique number out there, people, I think most of you got it, that does the job? You got it. Oh, now it's working. Hey, look at that. 
one half in both in both cases verify that that in fact is the thing that does the job right if you multiply now this is like this should be a like a big moment of pause in your life right I don't think you've ever seen a, a power like that before to the one half power can you raise things to like the 1.3 power yeah how does that work can you raise things to the pi power how does that work no, I have questions. I have questions, is all I'm saying. I, I understand really well now, even after our discussion a second ago, how to raise things to positive integer powers. I even know how to handle zero and negative numbers. But can I handle like a one half? Yeah. And if we're looking at a number 11 also, what is it? what does it mean to take something to one half? If you think you understand now, then tell me, what is 64 to the one half power? What is that equivalent to asking? I mean, apparently, here's the observation I want you to make. Apparently, doing this, taking a number and squaring it and then taking the square root, gives us x. And apparently, doing this also does. So what, is, what am I asking when I ask for the 64 to the 1 half? What, what is that really saying, Jordan? Yeah, it's the square root, right? I'm really asking, what's the square root of 64? And again, notice that at no point did I, did I I make really a choice here, except to, to go along with the rules we kind of already like. If we want our, again, just like we were having a discussion earlier about negative exponents, if we want our rules to kind of be consistent and still make sense and work, then we've kind of, our hand has kind of been forced into this definition, haven't we, hasn't it? If we still want this, this rule to work, check, then it, we, we just have to define it in that way, don't we? That by to the one half power, we really mean the square root. Okay. So I hope you see that on 11 and 12. You're making that. That's the big aha moment, right? Aha. Okay. Uh, what about number 13? What goes in the box? One third in both boxes. And then on number 14, in general, how do we express the nth root of x? x to the power of 1 over n. Now, I still have questions, and that's correct, right? So if you want to take the, the fifth root of something, like, for instance, on your calculator, if you want to compute, what is, 30, what is the fifth root of 32? Now, I already know the answer because we did it the second ago on the board. It's 2, isn't it? But how could you get your calculator to say that answer? Ask, what is the fifth root of 32? Calculator. What power could you take 32 to? Yeah. Yeah, the one fifth power. You could say 32 to the 0 0.2 power, right? So when you calculate, you could try that. What is 32 calculated to the one fifth power? And you should get two as the answer. And hopefully, you've now made sense of what that means. What would it mean to take 32 to the three fifths power? What would that mean? Keep in mind that I know every. I know lots about fractions. Doesn't that mean? 30, isn't that the same as doing 32 to the 1 fifth to the third? Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. Because of what I know about multiplying fractions here, right? Isn't that the same thing? Isn't 1 fifth just, excuse me, isn't 3 fifths just 1 fifth times 3? Yeah. And now I think I can resolve this if this really is the same. 32 to the 1 fifth we just talked about is? 32 to the 5th root. Which is the 5th through the 32, so that's? Two. So really what I'm asking for up here is Six. what's 2 to the third, which is 8. So 32 to the 3, now we can even handle 32 to the 3 fifth, or 32 to the 0. 0.6, if you like. So try, we'll play around with this, think about it, think about the consequences of what we've just had, said here. There are so many interesting consequences of this new choice. And I don't know if you've, really, if you've had an opportunity to explore this idea of having exponents that are rational numbers. Can you handle what it means to take something to the seven fifths power? I think you can. Now. All right, please finish the rest of these. If you have an